Welcome to Bumps, Babies and Beyond. In this episode, we'll be looking at everything to do with birth. From working out different pain relief options... Lately, women now are using water as their pain relief. It does work. I remember not wanting to get out of the bath. Exactly. Discussing the different stages of labour. The first stage of labour is the onset of regular contractions, but you're quite right that actually a lot of women don't know that they're in labour. Urban myths on how to bring on labour. And the stitches that go with it. I had stitches from yeah. my vagina up to my clitoris. In the C-section scenario, you still get stitches and they still ache and they still hurt and the scar forms and all of that kind of thing. And of course, not forgetting the dad's role in the delivery room. Realistically, it was just... I didn't really have a clue what I was doing. It's completely normal to have a million and one questions to do with giving birth and pregnancy, so I tracked down the midwife that helped me give birth to my first daughter to answer some of the more common questions. I haven't seen you since the birth of Ava. I know, I know. There's so many questions that if people had the opportunity to ask a midwife, they'd like to start with. So let's go mm. right to start. You've just fallen pregnant. You have the worst sickness ever. I had really bad sickness. Mm. What would you advise? If you've got morning sickness, then it can come at any time of the day or night. Um, it's not really about what you can eat because you tend to find that you can't eat. It's more a case of keeping yourself hydrated. It's a myth, isn't it, that your morning sickness goes in the first trimester? It is a myth. It's different for every woman. OK, some women have it up to three months, which is what they normally say in the textbooks, after which case you shouldn't have any, but that's not the case. It can continue. It may stop at three months and come back towards the end. If you find that you've tried to um, drink water and you're not tolerating it, and also if you haven't actually gone to the toilet to, to pass any urine, then you really do need to see the doctor. So can you tell me exactly what is a show? <laughs> Well, a show is a mucus plug that sits in the neck of the cervix. So it's slippery and slimy feel to it. So that's really Sometimes what Sometimes with blood in it. Sometimes there can be blood streaks present. However, not to be alarmed if that comes away after 38 weeks of the pregnancy, which is quite normal. It just shows there's been changes at the neck of the womb. From when you have the show, how long have you got until you have the baby? You could go end up being overdue. That has, is no prediction as to when you're going to deliver. How do you know how dilated you are? <laughs> well, this is good. You won't, unless you've done an examination on yourself. The only thing you'd know is, am I in labour? Possibly. And that's by timing your contractions. And your contractions should be coming at least every two to three minutes for at least two to three hours without, you know, spacing out and becoming irregular. Once that starts happening, you can more or less bank that you're in labour. Which is why we always advise that you ring up, get advice, and then we'll tell you if we think it's time for you to come in. Because the last thing you want to do is come and then end up going back home, false, false alarm. That seems to happen a lot, and then you hear of stories of babies being born on carpets or in the car. What you tend to find is that people ring up, they may have had two false alarms, gone home, and think, well, I'm not going to go in until it's really coming hard, by which time it's a bit too late. But we always say to, to ring up, because it can take a little while before you actually go into the true established labour. So what other pain relief options are available to mums? Start at the beginning, gas and air or entonox is the, the term. It's fabulous. It, it is. Also known as laughing gas. It doesn't cross the placenta, it doesn't hurt the baby at all. And literally, once you stop breathing it, um, it comes out of your system within 10 to 15 seconds. Second to that, we have the injection. It'll either be pethidine or dimorphine, opiates, um, which will not take all the pain away, probably about 75% of it, but it will, um, it does cross the placenta and it does make the baby a little bit sleepy, as, as does the mother. But that wears off in like a couple of hours. And obviously the epidural. Um, lately, women now are using water as their pain relief. It does work. I remember not wanting to get out of the bath. Exactly. It why does, does, it, why does it work? Well, it relaxes you. You know how it is when you're home, if you've, I mean, if you've got bad period pain, if you go in water, that helps to relieve it. It's the same thing. What's the best position for the mother to labour in? Definitely upright to assist with gravity. So we, we advocate that you just try and walk around, mobilise, sit on birthing stools, just to be upright. Even during the final pushes? If that's how she wants to deliver, yes. It's entirely up to the mother. She may not want to stand. She may decide at that point she wants to sit down or lay down, whatever. I didn't get off the bed. On all fours, <laughs> anything. Why women sometimes ask to take their nail polish off? We really want to see the nail beds, if there's a chance that you may go to theatre. Basically, it's all to do with um, looking at how oxygenated you are. 
your body is. So the anaesthetist may want to just have a little look at your nail bed. If it's nice and pink, we know you've, you've got enough oxygen going around in your bloodstream. And uh, we can't do that if you've got a nice French pedicure, manicure. manicure or pedicure on. Yeah. So it's either your, your, the nail polish from your hands or your feet will go. So on average, how long will a mum need the maternity pads for? The blood loss after delivery, um, which we call the lochia, can last anything from nine to 10 to 12 days. And it probably is advisable that they wear a pantaline or something, some sort of protection for up to two weeks. No tampons? Not advisable just yet in case of infections. When you're just out on the street, you hear a million and one horror stories of what labour can be like. I mean, it's not always that bad, is it? No, no, it isn't. The majority of the labours go perfectly fine, no problems at all. But labours like this, nobody's really interested in. We all remember the horror stories. So, um, but they're far and few between, really. That's what I would say to that. Well, thank you very much. Thank oh, you okay. for welcome. answering all those questions. There are a lot of women who are very relieved. Thank you. Now, when it comes to labour, lots of people think that the average labour can last over 24 hours. However, until they've had a child, they don't realise it's actually broken into three stages, often of varying lengths. Sometimes it's even hard to know when it's really even begun. I caught up with some mums who were very happy to share some of their experiences. Labour is difficult, but for me, it was the best challenge of my life. I actually had placenta previa and so I had to have a caesarean section. My labour came on very quickly, so we literally rushed to the hospital. Now, when I went into labour with Ava, I really didn't know what was going on. In fact, I thought it could be Braxton Hicks or it could just be sort of odd pains. Is that normal? Absolutely normal. I mean, the first stage of labour is the onset of regular contractions, but you're quite right that actually a lot of women don't know that they're in labour. You think it's going to be like the movies, you think your water's going to break, someone call an ambulance, get me hot towels. I sat there for hours going, am I in labour? I just don't know. I think that labour's different for every woman. So we look at labour in the first stage and it's the onset of regular painful contractions but you're quite right not for all women and that starts to dilate the cervix. And then you have the second stage of labour where you actually get to 10 centimetres and you deliver the baby. That's the pushing. And then there's the third stage which is the placenta which a lot of women are so busy breastfeeding and cuddling the baby that actually they're unaware of that stage. I mean talking of the labour, how would you describe the feeling, the sensation of, of giving birth vaginally? It, it did feel a bit textbook, actually, this sort of desire to, to push. It's so um, true, yeah. I know midwives often say it's a little bit like, imagine you're going to the bathroom and you, and, and you need to defecate. No, it's, 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 uh, but it was like that except stronger. And I was very lucky second time round. I, I pushed three times and, and my son wow. arrived. You didn't have this? No, okay. I didn't have this at all. They realised that the baby potentially could have turned and they had to rush me into theatre. And that was the first time I saw my husband go white when they gave him his scrubs and said, you know, we have to take her into theatre and do it an episiotomy and forceps, or maybe even a caesarean. You had forceps? I mean, do you remember that? You could feel a little bit of pulling and tugging, and you still have to push. The midwife is still there saying to you, you're having a contraction, although you can't feel it, now is the time to push. The only thing I did know was after the baby was born, he did have scratches across his head, and that was from the forceps. Now, you were overdue with both your babies. Did you ever have the dreaded sweep? Uh, I did. Not with the first one, but with the second. Well, can you actually tell us what a sweep is? Because I know what it feels like. <laughs> I mean, it feels like someone's got their hand up to the elbow and they're, I felt like they were almost pulling the baby's head down. <laughs> and it was like a bit like a washing machine. Would you say that's fair? Yeah, I think that's probably fair. I mean, that's the only way I can, I can describe it. <laughs> um, what we're trying to do, I mean, we don't know what starts labour. So when somebody's overdue, we stimulate the cervix. So what we're doing is we're sweeping around the part between the cervix and the baby's head to actually stimulate the hormones to actually start labour. Now, when people say that I was in labour for three days, for four days, what do they actually mean? Do they mean from when the contractions started then? Because it can't surely be the pushing. So it's the first stage of labour, so it's the actual onset of those contractions, which are often irregular. It's very confusing. Some people say I was in labour for three days. That's incorrect. I don't think it's incorrect. I think that actually for, for a woman to believe that and if she's got pains, you always believe women. And I think that as midwives, if a woman says, I've got pains, and they describe what's happening to them and you listen to their stories, then actually it could be. The important thing is listen to what people tell you.
Well, as you heard there, every labour is different. The only thing you can be certain of is it will happen in three stages, and that's a fact. It seems that C-sections are becoming more common. In fact, in the UK alone, the amount of women having C-sections has doubled over the past 30 years. Statistics indicate that one in four women will go on to have a C-section. I caught up with some mums who were very happy to discuss their experiences of stitches. I had a vaginal delivery. I've had a vaginal birth and a C-section. For me, it was a cesarean section. I've had the choice, C-section. Um, after experiencing the labour, um, I don't mind a bit of pain, but that just uh, crosses the line. My second birth was completely natural birth on just gas and air, but the first one I had an epidural. I didn't really feel like I felt anything. It probably sounds completely crazy to other women when I say I didn't get enough of the pain, but when they talk no. about the labour and the actual labouring feeling, I feel I, yeah. I didn't get it the first time round. I did have a natural birth, but I had an epidural and I felt obviously no pain, but because I felt no pain, I couldn't feel pushing. So I tore, but it wasn't the back end I tore, which is where they do the cut. It was the front end. So I had stitches from yeah. my vagina up to my clitoris. That's hard. And, I've not um, really heard of that. Is that quite common? It's not common, It no. isn't, is it? My first birth I tore and I had to have a lot of stitches and I would have rather have gone through the labour again than had the stitches. But then, obviously, it can't be that painful because when my first daughter was four months, I got pregnant with my second child. You were keen. Uh, we just didn't think it happened so quickly. God. <laughs> so what do you make of elected C-sections, as we hear about in all the celebrity magazines, people choosing just to have them as a lifestyle choice? A lot of caesarean sections are done for presumed fetal compromise, and what that means is baby is distressed. But elective caesarean section, because you have requested one uh, for no medical indication, is where you get the two-push-to-push scenario. The human body is designed to give birth vaginally, unless something goes wrong. That's another thing that's worth raising. In the C-section scenario, you still get stitches, and they still ache, and they still hurt, and the scar forms, and all of that kind of thing. Tell us what happened to you. Tell us your story. Um, well, I started labouring, and after two days, I went into the hospital for a checkup, and I stayed there, and until I was, was told that I should have an emergency caesarean. And I feel very, very cheated in that I felt I was over-medicalised and it was out of my hands. And I didn't think I gave my child, my daughter, the best start in life. When I hear you say that, I'm less of a mother because I didn't give birth. Yeah, that's how I feel. I don't think of you like that because I'm thinking, I bet you were up last night like I was. Absolutely. Or, you know, <laughs> you're, doing, you're doing the hours, you're putting the hours in being a mother. All the things that come with being a mother weren't in that one room at that one time, but you had a bad start. But I think for but me, I understand it was, that. Yeah, it was crystallised in that moment. Yeah. Everyone thinks a normal birth is laying there, a bit of gas in air, and the baby just comes straight out, the baby's perfect, you put it on your chest and stop feeding. Well, that's what the movies have sold but that's, us. But that's, yeah. but that's not life, is it? That's not life. And everybody's got a story to tell, whether it be traumatic or whether it be wonderful. So, stitches, wherever they are, are not much fun for any new mum. But as soon as you've got your new baby on your chest, I promise you, you won't even think about them. But first, we put some old wives' tales to the test. You've written your birth plan, packed your bags, and are waiting for your first twinge of contractions, but nothing happens. There's an endless list of urban myths as to what helps to bring on labour. Here are our top four. Fresh pineapple contains the enzyme bromelain, which is thought to help soften your cervix and bring on labour. Eating large amounts can help stimulate your tummy and therefore maybe your uterus too. Being upright encourages your baby to move down onto your cervix. As you walk, the rhythmic pressure of your baby's head on your cervix stimulates the release of oxytocin, a hormone which causes contractions. There's no scientific evidence that a curry actually works, but many women swear by it. Eating spicy food causes spasms in the gut, which because of its close proximity to the womb toward the end of pregnancy, can cause the uterus to cramp and kickstart labor. Many mums have used sex as a way to induce labor. Having an orgasm can help to encourage your womb to get labor going and is another way of releasing oxytocin. And semen may help to soften your cervix, ready for dilation when labor starts. So if you're feeling as large as a house and desperate to get your baby out, why don't you give one or two of these a go? They might not 
not be scientifically proven, but they look like they're fun to try, and you never know, they might just work for you. Now, let's be honest, mums don't really know what's going to happen in that labour room, so how on earth are dads supposed to know? I caught up with a group of dads to find out about their experiences. Well, my husband's role in the delivery room was really to be there for somebody to swear at. I think he felt a little bit lost, but he tried to help as much as he could. He made me laugh when he should have done, he was sympathetic when I needed it, and he was the most encouraging person I could have asked for. Now, you chaps are now allowed to be in the labour room. You know, I want to know from, from your perspective, what is it like? Uh, realistically, it was just... I didn't really have a clue what I was doing. I didn't know what I was doing, what I was meant to be doing. Um, yeah, I ended up, with, after the birth of Orem, just feeling guilty. Oh, really? That's yeah. our job. <laughs> Hand it back. <laughs> <laughs> when I was in labour, I remember the midwife saying, you know, support, support her, support her. And I got this. <laughs> that kind of support. Go on, you can do it. And I think it was more from a literal, like, get behind her and help her. We'll have ideas of what we think it's going to be like when we go into the labour room. Is it like you imagined, though? Longer. <laughs> so much longer. <laughs> I think with Katie, I think it almost went on like 27 hours. And that's a long, that's a long time for anything. And that, and that was scary. What we can do is just hold a hand and you're saying, it'll be okay, it'll be okay, it'll be everything be okay. And if you don't even believe that yourself, really. What happened during your, your wife's death's labour? Well, it was the labour was, went well. I mean, we had a water birth. But it was after the birth once the son had been born. You know, I didn't understand about you know, the third stage of labour. You know, baby's born, that's it, it's over. Yeah, we're good um, to go home now. <laughs> that's it. Um, and, yeah, there were some complications after. And I wasn't aware I was focused on the baby. And I just neglected Steph completely. Yeah, you because know, I just wasn't aware of what else was still happening. Baby was born, that's it. Why do you feel you neglected her? What happened after the baby was because born? Because I just totally focused on Oren, yeah, and, you know, totally, if you like, forgot about Steph. And it was only then when I turned round and there'd been some complications uh, through the delivery of the placenta, um, and then there'd been some quite bad tearing as well. In no way does she blame me or anything else from that point of view. She still thinks I did a reasonable job. Do you look at your partner differently after seeing her go through that labour? And I don't, no. Maybe I'm lucky, but no, I didn't suffer any you know, trauma or anything from seeing that. Were you traumatised? I, no, I don't think that should be done at the business end, so I didn't, I didn't, I didn't want to. I, I probably, there might have been a part of me that thought it would traumatise me and ruin things for future, but no, I didn't at all. Didn't want to... No interest, no curiosity? I, I don't know. Maybe I'm old-fashioned thinking there's some things you don't want to be seeing or shouldn't be seeing, and that's going to be on my list of one of them. Did you at any point, or maybe all the way through, feel helpless? Yeah, I, yeah, I, I think I did feel helpless. Because, I, and I felt I just couldn't... It's hard to see the woman you love in so much pain and not... Or, I have the perception you can't do anything about it. What was the biggest surprise for you during the labour? It's the role and me not trying to take control of it. I think we should try and teach dads that in that situation, you know, they're there to advocate and support the partner. What they're not there to do is take control of it. I, I do maintain that I guess we're the least important person in the room when that's going on. Not unimportant, just the least important. So, and as long, I think as long as I remember that, then you leave your ego at the door, you'll get by. But we do have a very important role, and if we do that role properly and support the partner properly, then, yeah, I do believe men can make labour shorter and less painful for women. I mean, do you still look at her the same way? Do you still find her yeah, sexually I, I, attractive, you yeah. know, straight afterwards? Like, not, like, immediately yeah, not afterwards, straight, but... Yeah, not, not definitely not straight <laughs> afterwards. Oh, look, no, this, is, this is a shower to It feels everything. better. Clever man. Yeah. Lots better. Astrid, she's been sitting there very patiently. I mean, hearing these daddies speaking so candidly. What do you see? What's your typical dad like in the labour room? Oh, it's, it's really mixed. You know, we do get dads that feel so disempowered and so afraid. Because I've seen men cry out, out of sheer frustration and misery because they don't know how to support. Can you give me some ideas for a dad watching this how he can be supportive to his partner? When they're in the room, they can do what their partner has expressed most of all. And for some women, holding a hand is absolutely correct. For some women, that isn't enough. So knowing their situation is, is the best advice that you can give to anyone. Well, what advice would you give to dads who, you know, they want to be supportive of their, of their wives and yet they don't really know how to be? 
I think you've got to prepare yourself. I mean, it's like everything else. You know, go and seek the information, go and understand it, you know, and find information that's specific for dads. Well, as you've heard today, new dads, you might be the least important person in the room, but that doesn't mean you're not important. Well, sadly, that's the end of this episode of Bumps, Babies and Beyond. Hopefully you've found these films helpful and informative. We'll see you next time.